Chapter 11 is a lot about relationships. We don't go too much into relationships in this class because we tend to be a little bit more focused on the medical side. But let's go ahead and take a little bit of a look. So one of the interesting things is, is what is a friendship? Um, they talk a little bit about some of the themes of friendships, but one of the interesting definitions of a friendship that I've always read is that it has to be voluntary between two people. And I always love the voluntary part. And the truth is, is just because I think I'm friends with someone doesn't mean that I'm actually friends with them. I have to have some sort of relationship with them. And it has to be of a mutual aspect. So assuming that we have friendships going and that we are mutual and that we both desire this friendship, then the question sort of comes is well, how do friendships build? So as we talk about the building of friendships, there is what we call the ABCDE of building a friendship. So the acquaintanceship stage is basically just when you get to know somebody. So you can look around your class and you can say, hey, there's somebody who looks interesting. You know, they're going into the same program as me. And um, I don't know, they seem funny. You know, I like funny people. And then you might at that point decide to sit next to them in the next class. And you start talking about some things and you discover that you both like science fiction and you both hate cowboy movies. Um, you know, you both have a uh, parents who have been divorced when you were teens but basically you're building up you're beginning to know each other this is called the social exchange at this point you exchange something with them they exchange something with you and it's a very careful tit for tat going back and forth if you give them too much they run away if you give them too little they don't bother to come back so during the building up phase is where we begin to decide if we want to keep this as a continuous friendship and then of course we have the continuous friendship Things keep going and we keep doing things together that are interesting. Now, eventually, most of our relationships, most of our friendships will go into deterioration stage. Now, the question is, is why do friendships begin to deteriorate? Now, it isn't usually from a big fight. That is generally not the reason that most of us begin to have friendships that deteriorate. It happens to do more with a change in your life, a change in their life. Um, different aspects that happen and that you're just not connecting quite like you did before. So one of the interesting things about people and friendships is actually a distance. So here I am, I'm in this little spot right here. I'm not very good at drawing, but we already know that. So the question is, is if I was to draw a circle around this person, how far do we tend to travel to sort of maintain a close friendship that may even turn into a different type of relationship. And you'll hear people give all kinds of different times, but if I had to get in my little car and drive, the question is, is how far would I drive? And we've got a pretty good answer for that. The distance between here, where you are, and the end of that circle is right around 30 minutes. So 60 minutes across, 30 minutes one way. When it gets to be much more than 30 minutes one way, we do find that most relationships begin to step back. They begin to deteriorate or they become Facebook friends. And think about it, we live here in Brevard County and we have a lot of good friends perhaps, but if that friend was to move to Orlando, you quite often begin to find that over a period of time that friendship begins to deteriorate. It's not quite as close as it was. Um, it may be that at first you see each other, you know, a couple of times a month and then it goes down to a month and then it's every couple of months. And then it, sometimes when there's a big event going on and we go to Orlando or they decide to come over to the beach kind of thing becomes more of a special occasion that you get to see them. So that's sort of the deterioration stage. And the ending stage is when we sort of lose that connectiveness. Now, ending doesn't mean that we never see them again. Um, quite often, I like to say the Facebook people are an ending phase. You know, you have them on Facebook, but the truth is, is you really don't communicate with them. It's more about just, you know, seeing what happens to them and following up on them. But you don't really have that connection. You don't really have that mutual friendship anymore. What you have is more of a, you know, I'm curious what's going on with their lives. Unfortunately, in relationships, there are also 
bad relationships, in this case, violent relationships. And so what I want to talk a little bit about is this concept of the battered women's syndrome. Now, battered women's syndrome is a true syndrome. Basically, this is when a woman feels that she has an inability to get out of a relationship. And the only way that she can get out of that relationship is to quite often do something violent or um, something very finale, final. Um, it is not a question that there are women who are in Bander women's syndrome who have killed their spouses. And why this happens is that, as you see through this sort of system here, is that after a while, the woman is completely separated. She's um, no longer with family or friends. And she may begin to feel like this is the only way that she's going to be able to get back to normal or the only way she may become safe. Now, one of the steps in this particular um, slide that I stole from somebody, and unfortunately, I don't know who I stole it from. Otherwise, I would give them credit. But I'm telling you now, I, I lifted this one, is that um, the, the battered woman who has children will have another step in there. If she feels that that battery may begin to affect her children, meaning is that she feels the battery will go after the children, she will perhaps look for a more finale way to end this. Um, when we're in class, I often ask, do you think that the battered woman is going to be somebody who's from a poor family, from a medium, medium income family, or from a wealthy family? And quite often I have people pick basically the poor family. Most people don't pick the medium family and a few people will pick the wealthy woman. Well, they are right. The medium income family, not as much happens there. In part, quite often in the medium wealth family, the woman has her own job. And so financially, she can afford to leave the relationship. So then you would say, well, it's the poor family because she can't afford to leave the relationship. And it is true. She may stay in a battered relationship for a longer time. But battered women's syndrome often involves killing your spouse, you might want to say. And the poor woman quite often is too afraid to kill the spouse because that could be the loss of her income. More, not only that, but in the poor -er sections of society, there is more help for a woman who may be getting battered. There are more shelters. There are more... Uh, systems in place. The problem with the wealthy women is that quite often the woman who is in this is a woman who is not wealthy to start with. She comes from a lower to middle income family. And one of the things he does is he separates her. He pulls her away from everybody she knows. And eventually maybe she gets to go live in the Hamptons or something like this. But if you think about this, there are not a whole lot of battered women areas in the Hamptons. And there's not a whole lot of houses together. Not only that, but he becomes very controlling. And it says there at the very bottom, the partner is controlling and abusive. If he's the breadwinner, which generally he would be, he controls the credit cards. She probably doesn't get any cash. They may not even use cash. So anything she goes to do, he knows about. They probably have expensive cars, which means it has GPS tracking systems on it. So even if she decides she wants to run away, he's going to know where she's at. If she says to him, I'm going to leave you because you're so mean, blah, 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 blah. He might threaten her with, and who's going to believe you? The sheriff is my friend and the lawyer, blah, 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 and da, 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 da. And basically convince her that she's not going to win. If she says, I'm going to take the kids with me. He's like, you're not going to take the kids and blah, blah, blah. So what happens is she becomes this trapped feeling. The other thing is, is that people quite often don't recognize that she is being battered. So she is in the Hamptons and she breaks her arm. He hits her. She falls on the stairs. She breaks her arm. They quite often have a concierge doctor who comes to the house and brings the x-ray equipment and all that and sets her arms. So that doctor has a record of that. But in the next season, they go to Aspen. And when they're in Aspen... She breaks her ribs and guess who she sees? A different doctor and a different person. And then maybe they go to New York and there she gets some sort of a contusion. Again, a different doctor. And what happens is quite often there's no medical record that follows them. Unlike the poor woman who tends to be going back to the same hospital all the time. And after a while, 
the authorities might even or the medical staff begin to recognize the signs of this in this particular situation the woman is being treated by different people at different places so quite often this battery goes for a very long time before it's recognized not only that but wealthier men if they tend to batter their wives they don't tend to do it in the face so much you may see wrists that are bruised but he needs quite often that good face um, to be the face of his party or to do whatever he's doing. Not only that, but he often has what we call the spies. Now, they don't start out as spies. They're the housekeeper. They're the lawn guy. And because he has had a relationship with these people, and he generally seems very nice and friendly, and he says to him, you know, I think my wife may be, um, she may be sipping a little on the alcohol in the middle of the afternoon. If you see her doing something, could you give me a call? If she suddenly seems to be leaving or packing her bags or doing something, you just let me know. I think I might need to get some help from my wife. And unknowingly, these people can actually begin to help him spy on what the wife is doing. So this sort of violent relationship, this battered woman syndrome, can lead to ultimately the wife killing the husband. One of the things that is interesting in this is that we call it the battered woman syndrome, but we may be beginning to see this as not just a woman syndrome. In part, that's because in these relationships between men and women, quite often it is the man who has the greater power. But what about our relationships with homosexuality? Now that we have homosexual marriage as a standard, you might want to say, um, are we going to see the same type of battery happening there? You see, in the past, two men who may be in love and um, wanted to create a partnership quite often still had two separate spaces. And so one partner could go back to their own apartment and quite often did go back to their own apartment so that the more powerful member of the relationship uh, perhaps wouldn't be known for their relationship. You have to think about people like Liberace and a lot of our movie stars in the past, um, they had people who were with them all the time, but they didn't live with them so much. So one of the interesting things that sociologists and psychologists are going to be studying is whether or not this syndrome would occur with any type of couple where you have one person having a lot more power and authority, you might want to say, over the other person. So far, it does look like it doesn't really have to just be women. It's more about power. We know that basically almost all of this type of violent relationship is more about having power and control over somebody. When we talk about abuse, we did talk about the fact that there is sort of a difference between abuse and neglect. So abuse tends to be purposeful. Where, abuse, where neglect is not always purposeful. It could be. But neglect could also be, I just don't have enough money to buy my son a sweater because it's cold outside. I just don't have enough money to buy fruits and vegetables because I'm, I'm poor right now. I've lost my housing, so we have to live in the car. That isn't always purposeful, whereas abuse is. The types of abuse often are caused for different reasons, as you see in this particular um, chart. As people who are going into the medical fields or the psychological fields, they're going to have a lot of training on how to spot abuse and how to report that abuse. So here I just like to introduce this and then move on and allow you to have the specialty classes on this subject as you want or as you um, desire. But it really does come down quite often to somebody on the outside helping the person report their abuse or even spotting it. Sometimes the person who's being abused doesn't even realize that they're being abused, you might want to say. After all, it's how they grew up. Maybe they had an abusive family in the first place and they're used to dad yelling at mom and hitting and, you know, dad yelling at them and taking out the belt and belting them across their butt when they were little. And so how is this any different? This is what life is, is how it's supposed to be. So what does make a successful marriage then? Well, first of all, we do know that the older the couple is when they get married, the more likely they're going to be successful. People who marry in their early 20s have a much stronger chance of having their marriage not succeed. And when it says here that couples have to have a similar interests and values, this becomes really interesting is that we tend to say, oh, opposites attract. Well, that's not exactly true. What we're talking about here is when you're talking about opposites, you're talking about more 
surface things like I like sci-fi and you like um, I don't know, action adventure. And so I introduce you to sci-fi and you introduce me to action adventure and then we discover that there's sci-fi that's action adventure. You know, I like um, country music, you like pop music and we kind of introduce each other to those things. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is your basic values. And when we talk about your basic values, if you're an optimist, it's very hard to be with a pessimist. If you are a... Um, Oh, let's see here. A conservative. It's very hard to be with a very liberal person. If you tend to be very closed minded and very traditional, it's going to be very hard for you to be even attracted to somebody who may be much more modern and um, expressive in their ways. So what we really find is that we have to look at people who tend to have the same values. That's one reason why a lot of times people meet people at their local churches, you might want to say, because the church quite often attracts people who have similar values in the first place. So you find that person has the similar values, and now you're looking for people who have somewhat the same interests. And what we mean by the same interests here is that you know, there has to be something that you enjoy doing together. If you don't find anything you enjoy doing together, then very quickly you're going to become bored or not particularly enjoy that person. And it's one thing to say on a date, well, I'll go try something because I've never you know, really tried it before, let's say opera. And this other person really loves opera and, and you really hate it. And all they do is talk about opera, opera, opera. And you know, for a little while, you can kind of pretend to like opera, but after a little while, you're not going to like opera and that relationship will begin to fall apart so it is important that we find some interests together however those interests could lead us to different aspects of it so you like horses and he likes radios okay well we can maybe combine that together so with this coming then one of the things that we have to say is why do married couples stay happy? And one of the big things that I always like to talk about in this particular section is this particular thing right here, the stress adaptation model. Basically, satisfaction is a function of a couple's abilities to deal with stress. And that is so key. If we can't deal with stress, then we find that we're going to find it very hard to stay together. Stress is what tends to cause things to fall apart. So if we have the ability to come together to deal with that stress, then we're going to find that this marriage is going to last and it's going to be happy. It is one reason why when children die in a relationship, so there's a couple who has a kid, it dies, um, quite often that couple will fall apart. They can't deal with the stress together. They they can't lean upon each other. The, the stress of the death of the child is what pulls them apart eventually. Of course, where there's a mom and dad, we're probably going to form a family as we get a little bit older. Now, there are two very common families. There's the nuclear family, mom, dad, most common in Western societies, but the extended family, which consists of children and grandparents and all kinds of other things living together, that's actually much more common around the world. And if we look at which is the most common type of family in the world, it is going to be the extended family. Now, in America, mom, dad, and the two kids, yeah, that's pretty common. But we're a new country, and we haven't had to build up over time. We are beginning to see some more extended family living, especially more in the cities, and as more people have come over from other areas who are used to extended family living. If we go around the world, quite often we have family compounds. It's not uncommon to have you know, a large couple of acres and you have three or four houses or in a city where a family owns what you'd consider to be an apartment uh, building, but they have four or five residents and it's all the same family living in there. So extended families are much more common. Being that we live here in a tourist area, we also have to understand that a lot of our tourists come as extended families. So you see these large groups of people coming over and they may all live together. That can be very challenging when we're at restaurants or if we're in ERs because they are used to being able to do everything together. Familyism is the other one that we have to take a look at. Uh, familyism is, is pretty simple. Basically, the family is more important than the individual. Uh, this can be seen quite often in countries or cultures where they really support one member of the family. So let's say one member of the family turns out to be really smart. 
So the rest of the family will actually work really hard to chip in so that person can spend their time studying and chip in so that person can go to the better school and chip in so that person can go to the debates or whatever it is they need to do. And we'll chip in to get that person a tutor so they can get good grades on the SAT. And we'll work together to get that person into college and to help that person live through college and get out of college and do whatever they need to do to get set up. Because what happens is, is that that for the family, that tends to be very good because that person is then now going to help the rest of the family move up. And so that person may send money to the rest of the family or help the other members of the family do things. They may work in their office. Um, they find another kid who's good and that family member is going to help, help each other. So the family takes over rather than the individual like a family business where you have um, a daughter and a son who begin to learn that family business everybody works together because the family business is more important than the individual family this is very common when we talk about communities where extended family living is more the norm for most people once they get married one of the next things that they look forward to is having babies or starting their own families we know that in today's western societies couples are having fewer and fewer children in part that's because of economics and you would think that oh it's because it's more expensive actually it's the opposite it's the fact that they are working and so less children is uh, easier to take care of but also the fact that basically our children are living when we had high death rates of children you would have multiple children in hopes of getting a few to adulthood but today we pretty much figure our children are going to make it to adulthood we don't sit there and think as some people used to have to worry about is that 30 to 40 to 50 percent of their children weren't going to make it to adulthood so 50 percent of my children aren't going to make it to adulthood i'm going to have six kids with the hope that three make it to adulthood today we actually have most kids make it to adulthood we have very few children who are dying young so we can push back having kids until we're a little older we're a little bit more settled we have a little bit more money but what's also interesting is that men who become fathers as they get older tend to spend more time with their children and caring for their children now in part the reason for this is that younger men are still trying to make their way in the world they're still working on their status and their relationships and where they're going to be or basically where they're going to wind up in life as we get more toward middle age we may have made our location we're kind of where we're going to be or we've reached to that pinnacle we also may have reached to an economic pinnacle where we can afford extra care or good quality daycare and so we have that ability to go ahead and have that child and spend some time with a child because we are able to have people who can help take care of that child I don't have to work perhaps as many hours or I can work from home because I'm in a more professional professional job men who are even older who have children quite often have them and really want to be very heavily involved in the raising of their children the older they get they may not have had any children or they had a child when they were very young and while they loved that child and they raised that child they just didn't have the time to be involved with them because they were still creating their life and they were still trying to create where they're at and so they have another child later in life because they want to be heavily involved so it is interesting with fathers as age comes their time caring for that children increases with another group of families we have is things such as step family now the step family is something that's pretty common these days what's interesting is is that as we have the next generation coming the Z generation is what they're sort of calling it these days you quite often find that they're not using the terminology like stepdad or stepmom um, to them everybody is part of the family everybody is a member of the family and as somebody once told me I don't have a family tree I have a family bush you don't hear them referring to their um, blended families as having my stepbrother or my half brother they're just my brother and the other kind of group we have to think about are foster families now foster to adopt families are basically a, an individual who has decided that they will foster a child who is in need of a family 
if things work well, they will be able to perhaps adopt that child. But quite often in foster families, they never get to adopt the child because the child is either not up for adoption, meaning that the parents have never given up their custodial rights, or there are other circumstances that come in. This is not a law class. But these are still true families, and they still have true feelings for each other. Our biggest problem with this is maintaining that bond they have with their foster children because the children may come in for three or four years and then be moved to another family. It's kind of interesting how that's done. With adopted families, probably one of the biggest fears is, is that they will not be able to bond with their child. They hear these stories of kids who never bond with their parents. And there is truth. There is a psychological conditioning in which young children may not bond with their parents. But for most adopted children, they are well bonded with their parents. Now, we did talk early on when we talked about babies, we have to remember that there is a sort of a, a critical time period when kids begin to develop a bond with an adult. So remember, they don't come out of the womb automatically bonded to people. Basically, you got food, I like you. But we do know somewhere around that eight month period until about 18 months, they're beginning to develop a bond with somebody. And we call it stranger wariness. And quite often children who may be adopted right at that point, that can be rather difficult for them because they finally bonded to someone and now they don't get to see that person. And so the adopted family who has gotten this child who's just crying and crying and crying thinks, oh, they're never going to bond with the child. They will bond with the child. The child will bond with them. They may have to give some time for that to occur because the child is grieving for the bond that they have finally made and a little afraid. And a family that is becoming uh, more established today is our gay and lesbian families. Now, we do know there are a lot of states that have passed laws that were against gays and lesbians marrying. Um, in fact, there are still lots of laws on the book that will not allow a gay or a lesbian family to adopt a child. They can foster a child, but they can't adopt a child. They could foster the child for 10 years, but never be allowed to adopt the child. But this is one of our, our newer type of families, you might want to say. Um, one of the interesting things that has aroused, because we now have uh, better data, you might want to say, on these types of families, is that people thought that the environment that the children grew up with would affect whether or not they too were gay or lesbian. And what we found is that children who are raised in a gay or lesbian household are, are not more likely to become gay or lesbian themselves and what they are more likely to do is be accepting of other gay or lesbian people but there's just as much heterosexual and homosexuality um in children in a gay or lesbian household as there are in heterosexual households. In fact, this thought that if there is not a father around that a boy will become a homosexual is sort of disproven with the amount of single mother homes that we have and a lot of single mother homes who do not have a father figure at all in there because as we know, women who are more middle-aged, um, they are not probably going to get remarried. It's much harder for a middle-aged woman to become remarried and so she may be raising her children on her own so there is no strong father figure if it was true that you know not having a man around makes you uh, homosexual then we would have a lot of gay little girls and boys running around um, what we do know is that this is going to be much more likely to be a biological we know that there's actually a gene that's associated with homosexuality if you don't have that gene there's probably never going to be homosexual. But the interesting thing is, is just because you have the gene doesn't mean that you're going to be homosexual. So there's probably going to be two sort of parts to it. Um, it's one reason why homosexuality probably also runs through families because the gene would be passed on. Um, there is some look at looking at homosexual uh, gay men's brains that they tend to be a little bit more feminine in nature. Um, one of the hypotheses, I remember hypothesis is an educated guess, so this may get disproven as you listen to this, um, is that perhaps there is something that happens in the testosterone wash when a child is in vitro. Remember, we all start female. And then um, what happens is the testosterone wash comes through and turns the fetus from female to male. Well, what if that wash doesn't come through quite right? What if the wash is a little behind or a little early or not enough or whatever? And we also have that recessive gay 
gene in us, then is that what may be causing a certain percentage of the population to um, understand that they are homosexuals rather than heterosexuals? A very complicated topic and one we're not going to go into much further than that except for that laws now do exist that allow gay marriage and allow hetero homosexual couples as well as heterosexual couples to have families. Unfortunately, where there are marriages, there are also divorces. So basically in the United States, there's a 50-50 chance that a couple is going to get divorced. However, the earlier that they marry, meaning as you see here between 20 and 24, the higher the percentage that their, their marriage is not going to last all the way to the end. Is this the same percentage around the world? No. Um, you have to remember in some countries, it's still illegal to divorce. In some countries um, where they may be super religious, they may never really officially divorce, but they go on to move with other people. It's still a type of divorce. Why people tend to get divorced is a whole lot of issues. But what is interesting is, is that if we look at the top reasons for women and the top reasons for men, the first three are basically the same. Communication problems, unhappiness, incompatibility. That's why we said that in the beginning for marriage to really work is that you have to be compatible. You have to have some sort of relationship based on common values and some common interests. Without that, we're probably not going to go ahead and really find that we're going to have a long-term marriage. It's going to be hard to keep up sort of, you might want to say pleasantries, if we really truly disagree at something that's really down into our core. When we talk about the effects of divorce, the one I always like is one of the most common things that will make a divorce not be successful is what we call the divorce hangover. Basically, this obsession that people have with their ex and keeping up with what they're doing and seeing what they're doing and being jealous of what they do. Basically, they get stuck in the past. They get stuck with what was. Um, this does not matter if you're male or female. Both do it equally. Uh, you can hear men talk about, I can't believe my ex-wife is doing this, 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 and this. And you can hear women go, I can't believe he did this, this. You have made two separate lives and it's time to basically have separate lives. And you know what? One of you might make it financially better than the other. One might get more recognition than the other. But the thing is, is that you're not together anymore and you have to learn to make that separate life. But if we become stuck with being obsessed with our ex, that is truly going to find that we have an unsuccessful divorce. So this is the end of this lecture. Um, again, as normal, if you have any questions, please email me at RamonaB at KaiserUniversity.edu and I will see you soon.